Hi, and welcome to Lifestyle Management. Now, I'm going to really hope that you enjoy this course, and more importantly, to take full advantage of the content to benefit yourself today, and perhaps start or continue some of your health and wellness throughout your whole life. Perhaps you may even have an influence on the health and wellness of people in your life, like friends and family. So this chapter, we're going to introduce you to health and wellness, what it is, some of the terms and definitions, as well as an introduction to the strategies of health and wellness, promotion of health and wellness in Canada, and we're going to review um, some typical barriers for some people when they are approaching health and wellness in their own life. So let's begin now. We're going to start with health and wellness as a general topic and then we'll work our ways towards how, um, towards how more specifically we can take care of our health and wellness. Now, many health and wellness programs are based on a very familiar health risk reduction and now these strategies that is to say these health re, you know health risk reduction strategies we're trying to reduce the risks now our textbook is going to focus on the canadian views of this health and wellness and we're going to look more specifically at the indigenous people's perspective on health and wellness now, we are going to use some of the material in, uh, from the Indigenous Health Authority, which is created um, by the Indigenous perspective on health and wellness or health. So the Indigenous Health emphasizes the interconnectedness between the physical world, the spiritual world, and between the individual and our own mind, body, and spirit. And this guides the concepts of what is known as holism. Now we're going to use this in our assignment. The Indigenous Medicine Wheel shares a traditional theology, philosophy, psychology, and the teachings of the Creator. The Indigenous perspective on health and wellness has created a visual depiction to assist with the understanding of the meanings and the vision of wellness. As mentioned, we'll be using this wellness, um, wellness medicine wheel uh, for your assignment, and you'll find that at the end of your chapter, in this chapter, chapter one, and also is attached to your assignment document. Now let's look at health and wellness um, and how we work within Canada around promotion. Now in Canada, we value health. It's been on a bit of a decline perhaps of late, the World Health Organization, who uh, defines health as not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but a state of complete physical and mental social well-being. Hmm. Now that's an important first step in looking at health. It isn't about not being sick. Health is more about what are the things that we can do to bring positive physical, mental, and social well-being to our lives? What are the preventative things that we can do? What are the good positive things that we can do to build these supports, these preventions, that these diseases won't come upon us? All right, so to gain a little perspective on the Canadian effort to move towards the WHO's definition of health, in 1974, the Lalonde Report acknowledged that vast sums of money were being spent to treat illness and, um, and were preventable illnesses. The definition of health moved from measuring morbidity and mortality. Now, for definition purposes, morbidity is the study of measuring of disease and mortality, which is the study of counting the number of deaths. Um, and instead, we moved 
and we viewed health more as a part of everyday living. In 1986, the, um, the Ottawa Charter Report identified three national health challenges. The first, reduce the inequities in the population, so more access to health care for all. Uh, less about disease, sorry, number two, increase prevention efforts. So this is less about disease and death. And then three, enhance people's capacity to cope generally, if not more specifically. Now the three mechanisms for health promotion were identified as self-care, mutual aid, and healthy environments. This was a direction of health promotion, if you will, in the early 70s and 80s to get the movement away from treating illnesses and more towards promoting health. Health and wellness is an important national value and has several health agencies, programs, and initiatives that are engaged to this, uh, engaged to this and include the Canadian Institutes like the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the Canadian Population Health Initiative, the Public Health Agencies of Canada, and the Canadian Institute for Health Research, First Nations and Inuit and Aboriginal Health Branch of Health Canada. A term maybe you've heard before, it was emerging in the late 70s, early 80s, participation. Physical and Health Education Canada participated in this. And you'll see this in Table 1.2 and a number of other provincial initiatives and programs. Health is something that in Canada we value. I've said that several times, it's because we do. Now there is a branch of science who study when things aren't healthy. This is a science of epidemiology. It's the study of how, how often no, sorry, how diseases occur in different groups of people and why. Epidemiology can be used to evaluate health strategies, prevention, prevent certain illnesses in groups as a guide for health care providers. Now it's an important element of science and researchers can examine the distribution of diseases in a specific population and that's called descriptive epidemiology. Now, alternatively, researchers can investigate a hypothesis or a hypothesized casual factors. Now, a hypothesis is kind of like an educated guess. That's called analytical epidemiology. Back in 2003, when SARS hit North America, more specifically for us Canadians in Toronto, when they go back and look at what occurred in, you know, in Toronto at that time, that's called descriptive epidemiology. What was the cause to the specific populations in the Toronto area hospitals and parts of Toronto? Researchers will be looking at Toronto and hypothesizing, well, what if that is analytical epidemiology? So if we carry on with our topics, we're gonna to start looking at wellness and that what we you know it, what we have known as the wellness movement to begin what is wellness well wellness means taking steps to prevent illness and involves a capacity to live life to its fullest so whatever we're doing so whenever we're doing things that enable us to live our lives to the fullest we are engaged in wellness activities an American, Dr. Helbert Dunn, has been considered the founder of the wellness movie during his time as a physician and chief of the U.S. National Office of Vital Statistics. That was in around 1935 to 1950. Another American, Dr. John Travis, being inspired by Dr. Dunn, shifted his focus from disease care to self-care and prevention. Now his model, which is sort of like a continuum, you'll see his, um, the model of this continuum figure 1.3 in your text. I think I have it up beside me as well. 
Now, Dr. Bill Hetler, co-founder, co-founded, if you will, the National Wellness Institute in Wisconsin. And in the 1970s, Hetler developed a lifestyle assessment questionnaire. It was later redesigned as a product named TestWell. There are six dimensions of wellness in this model. And you'll find that in figure 1.4 in your text. And we'll look at each of these dimensions individually. And we're going to start with the social dimension. This dimension encourages a collective view of the world. Instead of seeing us as um, an ind sort of we're all individuals, we're instead a part of a bigger picture, contributing to society, helping others, and valuing the concept of interdependence between the environment and ourselves. So the social dimension is sort of like taking ourselves out of the immediate forefront of the picture and looking at how we are part of everything and everybody else. Health educators are placing a greater emphasis on the sense of social dimension and wellness. Next, the occupational dimension. Now here we're looking at the well occupation. That is, a well is in brackets as I showed. Well occupation is consistent with personal values. So it's a job or a career that we follow that matches our personal values, interests, and beliefs. Now, you are comfortable and you are encouraged to contribute your unique gifts, skills, talents, and enjoy working. That is, the joy of the work that is meaningful and rewarding. If you're doing your work where you could get lost in it, be smiling while you're lost in it, you may even, in a moment of candor, say to yourself, you know, I would almost do this job for no money, even though in reality you wouldn't. That's when you're in, if you will, um, a well job. It feels like a life choice and that's a, a, what is healthy, a healthy occupation or a well occupation. Okay, now we move to the third one, the spiritual dimension. The spiritual dimension is the dimension in the model that identifies one's basic purpose in life. By doing that, you learn how to experience love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and helping yourself and others to achieve our own personal um, potential and all aspects of our spiritual dimension. Spirituality has been described as transcendence and connectedness, a power, a force, an energy. Spirituality can also include one's connection to the formal religion or faith. It could also be your own spiritual experience, one that separates, from, that separates you from the environment and the things around you. A recognition that there's another dimension outside ourselves. We will be expanding on this topic of spirituality in weeks 12 and 13. Next is the physical dimension. The physical dimension of wellness is met through participating in regular physical activity, whether that be aerobic, strength, or flexibility, maintaining a healthy body weight, or avoiding harmful behaviors such as tobacco use, or misuse of drugs, or excessive alcohol consumption. Now it's also important to get medical attention when it's needed and take care to use medical interventions such as prescription drugs properly. As physical wellness is pursued, a heightened awareness of the connection between body, mind, and spirit is often experienced. All right, let's look at the one that we call intellectual dimension. Now with the intellectual wellness, we refer to our ability to think and learn from our life experiences. We learn from our past, our openness to question and evaluate information. This is what makes it an important element. 
as excuse me as the more health and wellness we have in our lives the more we are able if you will to explore other alternatives to look beyond what is typical and usual for us the emotional dimension well wellness includes a degree in which one feels positive and enthusiastic about yourself and your life it's also involving the awareness and acceptance of a wide range of feelings in ourselves and in other people so whether you are emotionally well or you know, you have the capacity to express and manage your own feelings, to work independently, but also to recognize the importance of being able to speak, or sorry, being able to ask for help and support when needed. In the study of psychology, this is known as emotional intelligence. Now, the authors have introduced a seventh there we go seventh <laughs> dimension of wellness and they call this the environmental dimension under this the environmental wellness includes being respectful of and attempting to live in harmony with nature it means ensuring um, the stability and longevity of our natural resources and demand and demands leadership and long-term coordinated effort from all of us and now we're going to be expanding on this particular topic in healthy environments in week 11. now let's move on to health challenges that might affect one's ability to get healthy in spite of all of our best initiatives one of the reasons or one of the issues is that that of a demographic growth any populations that grow when we think of a population a demographic there are trends in demographic growth that can affect the health care services one of these trends that's affecting the ability of services to support people's health and wellness has been the rising costs associated with cancer and heart disease which are two of the leading causes of death for Canadians. That's followed by um, type 2 diabetes. Hypertension or a high blood pressure is a major contributor to poor health, affected, affecting one in five Canadians. Research indicates that there were, that where we live can have an impact on our, no, can have an impact on our lives too. The years of potential life loss, years of potential life loss or the YPLL are greater if you live in the northern regions of Canada. And you might wonder, well, why the north is not better for your health as there's less pollution, um, but there's also uh, less services and less hospitals and they're not as, you know, those services and hospitals aren't as dense in the north. Doctors don't tend to want to go to the north to serve as frequently as uh, larger cities where, one, they can make bigger impact on people's lives and two, perhaps make more money. Mental health issues are also a concern in this capacity. There are several disorders that are increasing in frequency. Major depression is reported by about 5% over the, over the year. Now, it is that, it's that that contributes to the higher demand on mental health services and the overall health services. Excuse me, coffee. Uh, fresh ground black coffee, dark roast. Perfect. Okay, let's carry on. Sorry about that. Canadians are now living longer. As a demographic, the population is getting older, not younger. And the costs are also therefore 
getting greater for uh, that support of Canadians as they age. The availability of health care services can also be significantly challenged. An area Canada has had leading role in is the research into social determinants of health. Outside of the demographic factors, um, the new research, Social Determinants of Health Canadian Perspectives, introduced 16 social determinants. They include, now these determinants are things that can affect our health, disability, early life, education, employment and working conditions, food security, gender, geography, healthcare services, housing, immigrant status, uh, income and its distribution, indigenous ancestry, race, social exclusion, social safety net, unemployment and employment security. Now they're all very important in terms of determining one's health and wellness status. Depending upon our relationship to any of the above mentioned, we can have a, it can have a huge impact on whether or not the desire to get healthy is possible. Now you'll find these 16 determinants in your textbook. Now lastly for part one, we're going to look at the health of college and university students. Of course, it's a big group and it's a group that has a lot of other pressures uh, that may not be something uh, that's a part of every other person's life. College-aged men are more likely than college-aged women to engage in risk-taking behaviors. Now that's not a particularly new or unique view. Uh, for many, dormitories and residences have proven to be breeding grounds for such things as meningitis. Secondhand smoke can pose long-term effects on people. Binge drinking um, imperils drinkers as well as those who surround them. Undergrads face risks in their psychological health. College students report more distress than in the general pop, uh, population and their peers who are not enrolled in college. The variety of roles that students play could, you know, they could be parents, I should say you could be parents or caring for your own children, caring for your own parents. You maybe have health issues of your own. Um, you know, you have a job or two part time. Um, there's a variety of things that could be going on in the lives of any students. And as people who work with students, we all need to be aware that this balancing that students go through first year students may suffer the most in terms of physical and emotional well-being being away from home perhaps for the first time cooking your own meals or uh, not knowing how to do that very well increased education has long-term health benefits though so generally good for you for choosing this course as there is much information that you can use to minimize many of these risks. And in fact, you can protect yourself from some of these risks. Now, I hope that this has been helpful. Um, this has only been part one of the introduction to um, health and wellness. Um, there will be a part two, and that will follow this one in the same week. And you will find that in this week, in week folder one. So everybody, keep up the good work and we'll see you in part two. Bye for now.